Well, thank you everyone for coming. It's great to see so many faces from History 25.3. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Zach Fredman, who you, m many of you met this morning, who is an assistant professor of history at Duke University, Kunshan. Uh, professor Fredman is a diplomatic and military historian whose work focuses on the United States and the world, modern China, and US East Asian relations. His first book, which he'll be uh, talking to us about today, is entitled The Tormented Alliance, American Servicemen and the Occupation of China, 1941 to 1949. And it just appeared with UNC Press in 2022, so just last year. It is about the US military presence in China during World War II and the Chinese Civil War. And Professor Fredman is currently starting a second book, tentatively titled R&R, The US Military's Rest and Recreation Program During the v Vietnam War. Um, Professor Fredman earned his PhD at Boston University in 2016. In 2017, he received two very prestigious awards for the research that became this book, which is the Edward M. Kaufman First Book Manuscript Prize from the Society for Military History and the Betty M. Unterberger, it's quite a name, Dissertation Prize from the Society of Historians for American Foreign Relations. So we're all very lucky to be learning about this research today. And this is a return to Dartmouth for Professor Fredman because in 2017 and 2018, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Dickey Center for International Understanding. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you so much, Professor Miller. Yeah, it's a real delight to be here. Uh, that time as a postdoc at the Dickey Center was really important in my career. Uh, uh, both uh, Professor Ed Miller, Professor Jenny Miller, uh, the rest of the faculty there, it was a really productive year that had a big impact on uh, this book that I finally succeeded in publishing last year. Uh, so that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. So this is a story about the U.S. military presence in China during World War II and the Chinese Civil War. And what I argue in this book is that this U.S. military presence transformed itself into an occupation that inadvertently undermined the US allied government under this man right here, uh, Guomadang party leader Chiang Kai-shek, and became a propaganda tool that the Chinese communists under Mao Zedong were able to exploit in their efforts to seize and consolidate power. Um, and so this is, I think, a new story about the formation an evolution and undoing of this U.S. alliance with the Republic of China, because this is pre-1949, before the People's Republic of China was established. And I think it's also a story that helps us to understand the transformation of American imperialism in the mid-20th century with some relevance for today. Um, so by many measures, though, at this time, uh, this U.S. ROC alliance was a success. It achieved its overall aim in 1945, a victory over the Japanese. And from pretty early on, both US and Chinese authorities gained from this US military presence. For the Chinese, the arrival of US forces in late 1941, early 1942, put an immediate stop to the Japanese terror bombing of Chinese cities. Because by the time of Pearl Harbor, China and Japan had been at war since 1937. Uh, so the arrival of US forces ends these bombings that had gone on for nearly four years. And the Chinese also emerged from the war with an elite core of US trained and equipped army units, the better part of about 36 divisions. The Chinese made some pretty impressive diplomatic gains out of this alliance as well. So in 1943 alone, the US government rescinded its extraterritorial rights in China. So ever since the 1840s, the United States government had exercised jurisdiction over all American citizens in China. So they give up that right in 1943. They also end the Chinese exclusion immigration policy, which had been in force since the 1880s. And at the Cairo conference, where Chiang Kai-shek met with President Franklin Roosevelt and Prime Minister Winston Churchill, uh, Roosevelt and the US government endorsed the Chinese position of all territories lost to Japan since 1895, returning to Chinese control at the end of the war. And I think the US benefited from this alliance as well. 
Uh, China got a small fraction of U.S. Lend-Lease aid, less than 1% through 1944, and only about 3% in 1945. During World War II, U.S. troop deployments in China peaked at about 70,000 personnel, Um, But keeping China in the war enabled U.S. and Chinese forces to tie down hundreds of thousands of Japanese troops that could have been redeployed in the Pacific or in Australia. Uh, So these are some of these benefits of this alliance uh, that transformed into an occupation. But by 1945 in the book, I argue that this alliance had crashed and burned. Um, And in fact... I argued that uh, Chiang Kai-shek lost his country in 1949, and this U.S. military presence in China ultimately contributed to his defeat. Now, over the course of my research, I tried to resist this judgment, but in the end, I couldn't really come to any other conclusion. So by anchoring larger Sino-American struggles over ideas surrounding race, gender, and nation, the U.S. military transformed itself into a widely loathed occupation force, an aggressive, resentful, and emasculating source of physical danger and compromised sovereignty. And after Japan's surrender in the fall of 1945 and the spring 1946 withdrawal of Soviet occupation forces from northeastern China, the U.S. military was identified as the chief obstacle in China to consigning foreign imperialism irrevocably to the past. So tracing this history takes us across U.S.-China relations during the 1940s. So not long after beginning my my research, I discovered that the rise and fall of this alliance turned upon the actions of a much larger cast of characters than scholars had recognized. So um, by the time I started grad school in 2009, much of the scholarship, and there's a lot of scholarship on wartime U.S.-China relations, focused above all on the contentious relationship between Chiang Kai-shek, who is the leader of the Republic of China, and this man, General Joseph Stilwell, who from early 1942 until fall of 1944 served as Chiang Kai-shek's chief of staff and commander of U.S. forces in China. And he had a very contentious relationship with Stilwell, Uh, with with Chiang Kai-shek, rather, that culminated in Chiang Kai-shek demanding his withdrawal in September 1944. He wrote to President Roosevelt and said, I can't continue working this guy. You've got to send someone else. And so what happened after this was that this scholarship on wartime U.S.-China relations basically took Stilwell's conclusions about Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang, or the Chinese Nationalist Party, as their starting point. And so Stilwell's ideas were that Chiang Kai-shek and the Chinese nationalists had no interest in fighting Japan. They were interested in just hoarding U.S. Lend-Lease aid, using it after the war against the communists, and that Chiang Kai-shek lost the Chinese Civil War because of his unwillingness to follow Stilwell's advice, his authoritarianism, and his corruption. But as I got into graduate school and I was looking for a dissertation topic, I came upon the work of a Dutch historian by the name of Hans Van Deven, who taught at the University of Cambridge. And he was somebody who took advantage of this tremendous archival opening in China that followed the end of the Cold War. So in 1988 was the end of martial law in Taiwan. So archives in Taiwan began opening up. And they continue to open up in the mainland China in the 1990s and early 2000s until the door started closing again, about 2012 and 2013. So Van de Ven was the first scholar to reevaluate this relationship between Chiang Kai-shek and Stilwell using Chinese language sources. And he was able to show that actually the Chinese made very significant contributions to the war effort against Japan not least uh, deploying their best troops twice in two major military campaigns in Burma. In 1942, as part of the defense of Burma, and in 1944, again, uh, when Allied forces pushed the Japanese out. And he also showed Stilwell's profound flaws as a military commander. This was somebody who had never actually commanded troops in combat before the war. And so I thought to myself, well, if scholars got this much of the story wrong, then there's got to be more to this. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to write a book or starting out with a dissertation 
that relied on Chinese language sources from all areas where US forces deployed. And so that's what I did. So if you see here, this is a map of China at the time of Pearl Harbor. And you can see these shaded areas are areas under Japanese occupation. So by the time the US entered World War II, uh, all of China was blockaded. And the only link to the outside world was this Burma road that stretched from Kunming through Laxiao to the port of Rangoon. But by March 1942, this was cut off. Uh, so for most of the war, the only route into China was this hump air route that stretched from here in Assam, in India, to Kunming. So most US forces deployed here in southwestern China. And after the war ended, another 54,000 Americans, mostly Marines, occupied these areas that were formerly under Japanese control, cities like Beijing, Tianjin, Qingdao, and Shanghai. So by October 1945, US troop deployments in China peaked at about 120,000 American personnel. By way of comparison, in 2010, the PRC census counted about 60,000 Americans living in China. So this was actually the largest ever encounter between Americans and Chinese that ever took place in China, but most of the scholarship had reduced it to this story about this contentious relationship between Chiang Kai-shek and Joseph Stilwell. So in tracing this alliance through archives from all areas where US forces deployed, from archives in Myanmar, in Taiwan, in the United States, uh, I was able to see that the rise and fall of this alliance turned upon a, ca a much larger cast of characters than other scholars recognized. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to figure out how day-to-day -day engagements between these American troops, 120,000 American servicemen, and they're almost entirely men, uh, under 200 women in the Women's Auxiliary Corps and Army nurses deployed to China. So it's almost entirely male. So how interactions between these soldiers and various Chinese groups affected the larger politics of the alliance and how US and Chinese authorities managed this American military presence. So um, I don't know, it looks like there's a good number of students here, right? Raise your hand if you're a student. All right, so yeah. So if you're a student and you're writing history, you've got to figure out how you're gonna organize your work. So as a historian, usually the default way to go is to tell a story chronologically. So that's what I wanted to do. I said, okay, we'll start with Pearl Harbor. We'll go to the end of the Chinese Civil War. But what I found is it made a little bit more sense in this project to organize it thematically around relations between American servicemen and key Chinese groups. Uh, so in the end, I had enough information to tell six stories about this US ROC alliance. So the first story begins shortly before Pearl Harbor uh, and then spans all of the Second World War. And so if you look back to that map I just posted on the last slide, China was, from the perspective of the Americans, the most isolated theater of World War II. Uh, it came at the end of this sea and air link uh, that stretched from Florida or the California coast all the way across the Caribbean, the Atlantic, Africa, the Middle East to China. Or in the case of the Pacific, soldiers had to sail all the way around Australia to India and then fly into China. So logistics and supply was a big problem. And by the time the US entered the war, the Chinese government really had little to offer the US militarily after four years of fighting against a much more powerful foe. So what Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalist government decided to do was to demonstrate their commitment to the alliance through the creation of a hostile program that would house and feed US forces in accordance with US War Department standards. So those standards include 18 ounces of fresh meat a day, 16 ounces of fresh vegetables. So the Chinese government envisions this hostile program as an alliance building effort, but also a nation building effort. And the idea behind that was the Chinese believed that if they could demonstrate to Americans their capacity to adhere to American standards of comfort, hygiene, cleanliness, then it would demonstrate to the Americans that Chinese deserve to be treated as equals. 
So in tracing this history of this hostel program, I saw that it succeeded operationally by keeping the Americans housed and fed at the Chinese government's expense throughout the war, but it failed badly as an alliance and nation-building initiative. So from the beginning, at the senior level, Americans understood this program as an elaborate ruse undertaken to cheat the U.S. government in any future settlement over Lend-Lease Aid. So right away, they were suspicious on the U.S. side that the Chinese were padding their numbers with an eye towards a post-war reverse Lend-Lease settlement. And from the perspective of ordinary soldiers, these hostels completely failed to adhere to these American standards. So for example, the Chinese government operated this program under the command of a general who was American educated, uh, went by the name of Huang Renlin. And in 1943, Huang traveled with Chiang Kai-shek to the Cairo conference and got to meet Roosevelt and they talked about hostels. And so Huang spent about seven or eight years in the United States. He knew a dietary difference was Americans like to eat beef, whereas Chinese like to eat pork, or so he says. But Chinese, uh, they did not have like USDA Angus beef. So they decided to use water buffalo as a substitute. So Roosevelt uh, asked Huang Renlin, what do the Americans think about eating water buffalo meat? He says, our chefs are so good, the Americans can't tell the difference. But he was dead wrong. In in all my research, by far the most common thing that comes up in accounts of ordinary soldiers in like wartime letters and diaries was how badly water buffalo meat tasted. Uh, And soldiers had a little regard for anything else in this hostile program. So this program that was undertaken to demonstrate that Chinese deserve to be treated as equals is actually understood by the Americans as evidence of Chinese inferiority and their incapacity to be able to adhere to American standards. And it's a similar story with the second half of the Chinese government's alliance and nation-building initiatives. So again, this was a program the nationalist government undertook to solve a problem. At the time of Pearl Harbor, the U.S. Army had something like 20 people who had been through Chinese education programs, Chinese language education programs. So the Chinese government, in cooperation with China's leading wartime university uh, called Southwest Associated University in Kunming, that's a wartime agglomeration of Peking, Tsinghua, and Nankai universities, that they were going to train college students and recent graduates to serve as interpreters. So again, the program succeeds operationally. Over the course of the war, The Chinese government and these professors at the university train about 3,300 college students and recent graduates to serve as interpreters. And they're present in practically every official Sino-American interaction. So these interpreters are really the lifeblood of the alliance. But again, with the Chinese government, communication was only part of this. Even more so than the hostile program, the government framed this as a nation-building initiative. So as interpreters underwent training, they had teachers reinforcing this message. They also had generals. And oftentimes, Chiang Kai-shek himself would travel and give a speech for the interpreter program graduation ceremonies where everybody reinforced this message that your job is to uplift the country. But then interpreters started serving, and they found out that the Chinese government lacked the capacity to keep them clothed, paid, and fed. So this fueled tensions at the higher levels of the alliance between China and the United States. And ultimately, the Americans had to take over much of the administrative control of the program. Um, And soldiers on the American side were generally dissatisfied with interpreters because they found them haughty and arrogant. Uh, Interpreters on the Chinese side were given officer rank, And they kind of took it as an insult if Americans wanted them to do anything other than translate. Whereas in the U.S. military, there was a different kind of conception of military manliness that didn't really translate well into Chinese culture. So by spring 1945, disputes between soldiers and interpreters led interpreters to stage strikes at uh, U.S. military bases and training sites across the country. So Chiang Kai-shek had an American advisor, a Chinese-speaking missionary, put together a liaison team comprising other Chinese-speaking American missionaries, officers from the U.S. military, and also some of the teaching staff at the interpreter training program. And they went around China to conduct an investigation of interpreter morale, speaking to like five or 600 interpreters. 
And almost without exception, they found interpreters disgruntled with their work. Uh, They felt like they had been deceived by the government. But even more than that, the biggest complaint was that the Americans failed to treat them as equals. So again, a program that was crucial to Allied victory became a source of tension in the alliance and also failed in its broader nation-building aims. So next chapter, I look at military-to-military relations. So this was what the U.S. government was hoping to achieve in China. They didn't deploy ground combat forces. They deployed Army Air Force personnel and they deployed a lot of advisory troops. So they understood their mission as improving the fighting efficiency of Chinese armed forces. And so at the senior level, relations deteriorated pretty quickly because General Joseph Stilwell devoted his entire tenure in China to trying to take command over Chinese armed forces. So he was finally recalled at Chiang Kai-shek's insistence in fall of 1945 and replaced with this man, General Albert Wedemeyer, uh, who proved to be more diplomatic and capable than Stilwell. So under Wedemeyer's command, uh, the U.S. military in China focused on large-scale training programs, like you see here, uh, that took place mostly in India, but also in Yunnan province. And what happened is, although military-to-military relations improved at the senior level as a result of the more diplomatic Wedemeyer and these large-scale training programs, they deteriorated at the level of interactions between ordinary American and Chinese soldiers. So that by about July and August 1945, violent confrontations between Chinese and U.S. forces were happening just about every single day. And these relations deteriorate at the lower level because Americans at the lower level also replicate Stilwell's kind of efforts to take control over Chinese forces. You know, Americans came to China convinced that they had come there to save the country. They trained and equipped Chinese forces uh, with what they saw as money from U.S. taxpayers. So as Chinese troops began moving from India back to China, uh, there were a lot of confrontations about U.S. authorities attempting to control and really exercise command over Chinese troops. But as Chinese troops gained combat experience, and they saw that they were the ones doing the fighting, while Americans mostly served in advisory and logistical roles, uh, they became less inclined to play second fiddle to these American personnel. Now, in the next chapter, I look at military to civilian relations. So the contempt that most American military personnel felt towards their Chinese allies was also the product of everyday interactions with civilians. At the beginning of the war, Chinese and U.S. authorities didn't really take civilians seriously at all. They were kind of an afterthought. And as U.S. forces expanded, they really only were seen as useful for labor projects, like you have here, uh, where they're building runways for U.S. forces in southwestern China. At some of these bigger sites, bigger airfield sites, as many as 300,000 Chinese civilians uh, were mobilized to build and expand runways. Uh, But again, relations deteriorated pretty badly and pretty quickly. Uh, So at the beginning of the war, Chinese welcomed American servicemen. You know, they were particularly grateful for putting a stop to these Japanese air raids. But by 1945, Chinese came to see American military personnel as both a potential lifeline and a source of physical danger. And this is a result of Increased U.S. troop deployments over the last year of the war coinciding with China's worst economic crisis of the entire war, which was brought on by Japan's 1944 Ichigo campaign, which basically cut China in half and sent hundreds of thousands of refugees to southwest China. So more Chinese than ever were dependent on Americans to earn a livelihood. And uh, from the perspective of Americans, they really came to see all Chinese as potential thieves. So by this time, there was a lot of theft and there was a lot of violence against Chinese civilians. So a lot of the violence against civilians was the result of the U.S. military not giving up its extraterritorial rights in China. So at the same time that the U.S. government rescinded extraterritoriality in China, 
They signed another treaty giving the U.S. military exclusive jurisdiction over all American military personnel serving in China. Uh, This was the same thing that the U.S. did in Britain, Australia, and other allied countries during the war. But a key difference was in Britain and other countries, local police still had powers of arrest, and they refused to give Chinese powers of arrest. So basically, um, the only way that Americans were disciplined for crimes against civilians, for vehicle accidents, for accidental shootings, were if they got caught in the act by American military police. And now to get back to this theft side. So there really was a widespread epidemic of theft that only got worse through 1945. And I think the U.S. military dealt with, dealt with this theft problem in one of the worst ways possible. So China is ruled by a party called the Guomindang, called the Nationalist Party, and they're fighting a war against foreign imperialism. But the U.S. Army judge advocate in China authorized the U.S. military to use deadly force uh, to halt the theft of U.S. government property. So what this does is, in effect, it makes the U.S. military judge, jury, and executioner over any suspected theft by Chinese civilians. Uh, So this happens a lot during the last year of war and continues on after 1945. So very often, uh, the U.S. military is killing children uh, who are suspected thieves. But the one element of military-civilian interactions that finally produced a violent backlash was sexual relations between American servicemen and Chinese women. So by the spring of 1945, two narratives about sexual relations emerged in China. The first one came out in newspapers and magazines, many of them associated with the government, where they began to criticize what they called Jeep Girls, which is an epithet coined uh, after the Jeep military vehicle used to describe Chinese women who fraternized with American servicemen. So these articles criticized the women. They said these women were betraying their country by fraternizing with U.S. forces. But at the same time, this other narrative emerged that I first began to see in police blotter uh, that then spirals into widespread panic. And that was that U.S. soldiers were also using Jeeps to rape and kidnap uh, what they called respectable women. So in March and April 1945, Chinese boys and men began attacking American soldiers and their female companions in cities like the wartime capital of Chongqing, in Kunming, and Chengdu. And it got so bad that on May 16, 1945, General Albert Wedemeyer sent out a memo, the only one I, I found over the course of my research, that he ordered to be read aloud before all American soldiers serving in the China theater. And what he said was that there was a crisis in Sino-American relations, and it resulted from the misconduct of American military personnel. So at the time, there's about 45 or 50,000 U.S. troops deployed in China, and he estimated that at least about a third of them were guilty of some kind of offense, ranging from public drunkenness and aggressive heckling to sex crimes like rape. But two days later, he wrote to Chiang Kai-shek about the same problem. And when talking to Chiang Kai-shek, he said Chinese newspapers had launched a campaign against U.S. forces and that you need to use your police and your paramilitaries to bring these civilians in line. Otherwise, I am not going to allow U.S. forces to be embarrassed in public. Uh, So basically, he strong-armed Chiang Kai-shek into going back and presenting another narrative, a real preposterous Jeep Girl counter-narrative that said actually Americans are just being respectful, that Americans uh, in the United States hold up women at an almost unimaginable height, uh, and included even like a widespread propaganda campaign within the Chinese government and military uh, called How to Guide Our Troops and Our Cadres to Get Along with Allied Forces. Chiang Kai-shek himself wrote the introduction. That was all about this high level uh, that Americans held women up to. Uh, Naturally, this campaign really fooled nobody. And to go back to those military-to-military confrontations, by summer of 1945, many of those confrontations were occurring uh, when Chinese soldiers saw Americans in the company of Chinese women. So the last chapter of my book gets into the Chinese Civil War. And so really, from the alliance to the Guomindang, this is when everything comes undone. 
So about 54,000 U.S. Marines deployed to these areas that were formerly held by the Japanese, and these troubling patterns of wartime interaction continued. W widespread theft, violence against civilians, vehicle accidents, accidental shootings, but only now it occurred in an entirely different geopolitical context, uh, with Japan no longer a common enemy, the Chinese communists were able to exploit resentment against the conduct of U.S. forces and use it as a powerful propaganda tool. So I think each of these six stories in the book tells a distinct story, but as a whole, they reveal something more. So if this is a book about the rise and fall of the U.S. ROC alliance, it's also a book about the transformation of U.S. empire in the mid 20th century. So these stories inscribe the arc of America's rise to global preeminence and more broadly, this worldwide shift from a traditional colonial model to a more post-colonial model of domination and wielding power. So I think Sino-American engagements in China are rooted in the cultures and institutions of empires. So among those are hierarchical relations, which empires produce by racializing and engendering. The way that American servicemen racialized the Chinese with striking speed and consistency was something that really struck me in the research. Soldiers, they typically came to China after staying in India, where they really encountered the greatest poverty they'd ever seen. And then they got to China and the War Area Service Corps that ran the hostile program really threw out the red carpet, welcomed newly arriving soldiers with banquets. And so when Americans got to China, oftentimes their initial impressions were positive. And they would write about Chinese as humans, referring them to the Chinese, talking about the things they saw. But within weeks, months, those perceptions really deteriorated. And then Americans begin referring to Chinese by racial slurs, uh, like the word chink and slope. And they really attribute all of these problems in China to what they see as racial inferiority of the Chinese. So this kind of racism is important in any kind of imperial relationship. And it followed a similar trajectory to the way that Americans racialized the host country population, their colony in the Philippines before the war. So these imperial interactions are also mediated by the senses. I talked before about taste, you know, how this water buffalo meat really influenced the way that Americans understood and perceived the Chinese. And empires are also tutelary. They're structured around a inclusionary development-oriented politics where the dominant power uh, aims to uplift the other country. And Chiang Kai-shek Kai accepted this because really he had no other choice. He was dependent on the Americans for his survival. But imperialism, American imperialism in China didn't emerge for the first time in World War II. By the time of World War II, US forces had actually deployed in China for more than 85 years. And for much of the 1920s and even part of the 1930s, China was actually host to the largest deployment of US troops on foreign soil anywhere in the world. It doesn't count the Philippines or the Panama Canal Zone that are technically under US sovereignty. But as many as five or 6,000 American troops are deployed in China. There is also this ideological narrative, like you see on the left with this United China Relief poster uh, that posited this special relationship between China and the United States, that America served as like a father figure or an older brother helping to democratize and Christianize China uh, and was rewarded with gratitude from the Chinese. And, but I have to say though, even though there were these problems in US-China relations, I don't think the undoing of this alliance was inevitable. Uh, this is because Americans and Chinese still had a lot in common. Chiang Kai-shek wanted to modernize and reform his military along US lines. He also had a successful track record in the 1930s of cooperating with Nazi German and Soviet military advisors. So I think if the Chinese could have got along with Soviets and Nazis, they definitely could have gotten along with the Americans. Much of the nationalist government elite in government, in business, in education, 
Uh, these are people that spoke English, that had been educated in the United States. And a lot of these Chinese elites wanted to emulate American models along other lines. Um, so ultimately, if this would have worked, it would re have required a very soft touch. And that is not at all what the Chinese got. So in the end, this Republic of China's support for the US military presence became delegitimizing to the nationalists and contributed substantially to the demise of Chiang Kai-shek's regime. So to go back to 1946, anti-Americanism is resonating widely by this time. And it exploded into the largest protest movement of the nationalist era on Christmas Eve 1946, when two intoxicated Marines raped a 19-year-old Peking University student in Beijing. Within days, the US military estimated that about half a million people had marched in cities across the country, all the way from Xinjiang to Taiwan, demanding that US forces leave. So this takes place right about the time that US efforts to mediate between the nationalists and communists fall apart. And uh, US forces begin a gradual drawdown, though, that doesn't end all the way until the summer of 1949. So in the end, Chiang Kai-shek's fall in this 1949 revolution brought about the very outcome that US intervention in alliance with an occupation of China had aimed to prevent. So the world's most populous country had fallen under the control of a power hostile to the United States. Now, I don't think you can attribute something as massive as the Chinese Civil War to any one cause, but the US military presence did undermine the nationalists both militarily and politically. Militarily, the US presence undermined the nationalists because the US military uh, operated an air and sea lift of about a half a million nationalist troops, which enabled them to undertake an ill-advised military offensive in northeastern China, in Manchuria, uh, which was the region where they ended up losing the civil war militarily. You know, once the communist campaign was successful in northeastern China, uh, they rolled over the nationalists and expelled them to Taiwan within a year. But I think even more important than that, it was the US undermining the nationalists politically through the conduct of American personnel uh, that the Chinese communists were able to exploit to turn public opinion against the nationalists in Chinese cities. So the tormented alliance also reveals what I call the occupation of China's long shadow. And this really begins right away. In the fall of 1949, the US government recognizes the Chinese nationalists are going to lose the Chinese Civil War. And the Truman administration orders the State Department under Secretary of State Dean Acheson to publish what became known as the China White Paper. And so this is a, an 1,100 word collection of documents and narrative about US-China relations primarily between 1944 and 1949, the central point of which was that the nationalists were going to lose the Chinese Civil War and it was all the fault of Chiang Kai-shek. The Americans had done everything they could to help him. What really struck me in reading the China White Paper was there's not a page or even a sentence that addresses the conduct of US forces in China. But the conduct of US forces were soon, was soon used in China to mobilize support for a new war. So in October 1950, the new People's Republic of China decided to intervene in Korea. So less than a year after establishing the PRC, Mao Zedong faced this task of mobilizing China's war-weary population to support a potentially catastrophic war against the United States. And they made painful memories of the US military presence a historical touchstone of this new China. So the Chinese, uh, the People's Republic of China launched what became known as the Resist America and Aid Korea campaign. And this was a massive propaganda campaign that included just about every kind of media that was available at that time. Books, plays, newspaper articles, pictorials, music, uh, and most importantly, denunciation meetings called Kong Su Hui in Chinese. And all across the country, Chinese propaganda cadres reported that the most effective means of mobilizing hatred for the United States and support for intervention in Korea 
were at these denunciation meetings where people told their stories of mistreatment at the hands of American servicemen during the 1940s. Um, but this war in Korea also enabled the nationalists to consolidate their rule on Taiwan, underpinned by a revived U.S. ROC alliance that quickly fell into troubling wartime patterns. So here you can see pictures from the 1950s showing the privileged living conditions of American military personnel in Taiwan. So they enjoyed American-style housing, diplomatic immunity, and all of these same kind of things that had caused resentment in the 1940s. And this culminated in large anti-American riots in May 1957, when a U.S. military court acquitted an American sergeant who was on trial for killing a Chinese man who had allegedly been peeping on his wife while he took a shower. So like the Jeep girl crisis earlier on, Chiang Kai-shek cracked down, and this U.S. ROC alliance continued. But interactions with Chinese civilians in the 1940s and 50s also established patterns that followed the U.S. military elsewhere in Asia, particularly in the 1950s and 60s. So wherever U.S. forces deployed, you saw the emergence of boomtown economies based largely on prostitution and alcohol. Status of forces agreements facilitated crime and misconduct. Uh, and here you have some uh, images of the sex tourism industry, both in Korea in the 1950s and more recently in the Philippines, uh, where it even outlasted the U.S. military presence as U.S. troops were finally evicted from the Philippines in the early 1990s. And uh, I have one newspaper article here about the particularly uh, brutal 1992 rape and murder of a South Korean sex worker at the hands of an American enlisted man uh, that mobilized the first real broad-based nationwide movement against the U.S. military presence. And I think this experience in China also cast a long shadow over U.S. statecraft in Asia. Uh, so the so-called loss of China, uh, China's Chiang Kai-shek's defeat in 1949 and fears of American expansionism uh, supported uh, John F. Kennedy's efforts uh, to shore up South Vietnam. And Lyndon B. Johnson in 1964 um, you know, made this decision to undertake a large-scale war effort in South Vietnam in part, as he said many times, because he didn't want to be the president who loses Southeast Asia, the way the Americans had supposedly lost China in 1949. Uh, I had some pictures of military training because these military training programs that the U.S. pioneered in China uh, have been repeated really down to the present. U.S. trained hundreds of thousands of Chinese forces during the 1940s, dwarfing any kind of smaller effort in the Caribbean or the Philippines before the war. Uh, and since, uh, since then, this has continued as a key tool of U.S. statecraft. And I think most recently, this war in Afghanistan really reveals the influence of patterns set more than 50 years before 9-11. So the U.S. military spent some $2 trillion attempting to remake Afghanistan over two decades along American lines, above all through a program of army building, security forces training. Uh, like in China and Vietnam, this relied on the efforts of thousands of locally uh, hired interpreters. And uh, the media portrayals of Afghan leader Hamid Karzai during the Afghan war really struck me for their parallels to the way that Americans portrayed Chiang Kai-shek in the 1940s. Uh, American diplomats, military commanders, and the media constantly upbraided Karzai's administration for its corruption, uh, really rarely pausing to consider how this massive infusion of U.S. economic and military aid influenced that situation. Uh, on the ground, uh, U.S. forces racialized host country populations in Vietnam and South Korea with the same sort of speed and consistency, uh, only different pejorative terms used to refer to the local population. So the Taliban, uh, like the Chinese and Vietnamese communists before them, was able to exploit grassroots resentment against the U.S. military presence, draw sustenance from across the border, and build up armies that proved much more capable than their U.S. trained and equipped adversaries. In the case of the Taliban, really prevailing with remarkable ease after the withdrawal of U.S. forces last year. 
So I think if Dean Atchison and the Truman administration had um, taken a more thorough accounting of the U.S. failure in 1949, uh, they would have maybe reached some of the following conclusions. First, building up a foreign army that advances U.S. policy objectives is very, very difficult. Uh, no amount of U.S. military aid or logistical force our logistical support can imbue a fighting force with uh, a, a fighting force, sorry, a military with fighting spirit. I think second is that army building is inherently paternalistic and neocolonial, uh, which predisposes Americans to blaming junior partners when things go wrong, particularly in non-Western contexts. Third is that history really matters. Uh, Americans in China thought they'd come there to save the country. They professed good intentions, but Chinese understood their engagements with Americans through this longer history of American imperialism in China. And I think you see similar things in other countries that have been victimized by imperialism and racism. And finally, extraterritorial jurisdiction enables a military to transform into an occupying force. So I think the U.S. military failed to heed any of these lessons in 1949. Whether they do so today remains to be seen. So thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions you've got about the project. Yes. One question that I have is so um talked about how China was viewed as being this isolated theater sort of cut off from uh by land is that working? Uh being cut off by land and sea, uh you had to come in over the hump. Yep. What about coming in from like Russia or since they were sort of an ally, it was just sort of impossible to get there because of the Nazis or it was because Russia and Japan had a neutrality treaty. Okay. And then, yeah, that land route, even before that neutrality treaty, was, was very poor. Uh, so very little aid was able to get over that land route, you know, that stretched basically through Xinjiang and Gansu province. But by the time of Pearl Harbor, that was already cut off. And then the Soviets didn't join the war until the very end, until August 1945. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> well, yeah. Hey, um, good to see you again. <laughs> um, what, in terms of uh, having studied U.S.-China relations back during the during the Cold War era, during the Mao era, when they were we didn't we barely even had relations with the co communist country, how do you compare to where we're at today? And would you say that we're in a new Cold War with China, or is that overblown? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And I think like a lot of historians who look at 20th century issues, you know, I'm really interested in having a historically informed understanding of the present day. I think when you go back and look at the history of US-China relations, you do see some patterns that repeat. You know, because of this idea, you know, the Americans have this idea that they serve as China's model for modernization, and that China should follow an American-style path to modernity. And I think a lot of Chinese throughout uh, modern Chinese history have also seen the United States as a country that has knowledge or goods of special interest to China. And so I think what's happened more recently is we're going through another bust in this cycle where Americans realize, you know, they thought maybe through the 1980s and 1990s that China was liberalizing and potentially would modernize along an American model. And people seeing that not really happening today. Under Xi Jinping, China has become more authoritarian. Uh, and obviously, you know, that's, the relations have really deteriorated over the last few years with the Trump trade war, but then the Biden administration continuing many of these kind of policies. Um, I don't think, you know, it's, I don't think it's analogous to the kind of relationship they had against the Cold War, which, or that they had during the Cold War, which you alluded to, because yeah, between 1949 
and Nixon's trip to China in 1972, there were no diplomatic relations whatsoever. There was no trade with China. Uh, China was demonized in the United States. The United States was demonized in China. The only thing you really had going on were secret talks at the level of ambassador taking place in Warsaw. So now today, uh, China is the United States' largest trade partner. Uh, you know, there are more than 300,000 Chinese students in the United States. Uh, so, they're, so the two countries are linked up very close in business and these people-to-people ties. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, relations, I think, are definitely the worst they've been since 1979. And I really have a hard time seeing them get better anytime soon. Um, I think under the current administration in China, under Xi, they're very nationalistic, very hypersensitive to any perceived slight at the hands of, of a Western country, particularly the United States. So I think any kind of measure, anti-China measure by the United States is going to be reciprocated by China and, and vice versa. Uh, right now, I mean, uh, hostility to China is one of the only things that Republicans and Democrats are able to agree on. So politically, it's hard to see a way forward despite these close ties of trade. Thank you, Zach. It's, uh, it's such a pleasure to have you back at Dartmouth and to, to have you presenting on the, the final results of this project that you, you started working on here, or you started yep. even before, but you were, you were working on it here. So let me, I, I think one of the great strengths of this project is how you've sort of recovered this alliance that has been kind of overlooked in a lot of the scholarship on 20th century American alliances. And you show that this is a really important alliance, both because of the timing and the scale, mm -hmm. right? This, this is actually enormous, the, the, the sheer scale of the number of, of US forces. And it takes place before the Cold War starts and before all of these subsequent uh, alliances that, that are so important in U.S. foreign relations after 1945 in countries like Japan and Korea and Germany before all of those are, are formed. So, so it seems like this is a really important topic that, that has been overlooked. I wanted to ask a little bit about the, the idea that, that this is a pattern, right? That mm -hmm. this alliance and the failure of this alliance uh, being sort of a pattern that that sort of explains subsequent failures in in U.S. alliance relations and, and politics. It seems to me that it, certainly you can you you brought up South Vietnam and Afghanistan and and those are American alliances that end not just in failure but in military defeat as in in China in in 1949. However, there are these other alliances, including some of the ones you, you cited here, where on the one hand, you see some of the same issues, some of these um, sort of uh, flashpoints around the behavior of US personnel and these, um, you know, sort of very patronizing and, and racist attitudes on the part of the United States that provoke uh, the, the anger of, of allied nations and, and publics. And yet they don't bring down the alliances, right? So in the case of Japan and South Korea, you have, you know, throughout the Cold War and, and since then, you've had these episodes uh, in which there's been a lot of popular anger generated. But those alliances seem pretty strong to me uh, today even though you still have really large U.S. military presences in those, those countries. And in the case of the Philippines, yes, the United States gets kicked out in the 1990s, but now the United States is back in, in the Philippines, and, and the Philippines is also one of these, uh, these allied countries in, in East Asia where the U.S. retains its, its support. And what's more, there's plenty of examples of these allied countries when the United States says, oh, we want to draw down our forces. We want to scale back on this alliance. Mm 
It's actually the alliance partners who resist that. And you see this in Japan sometimes and, and, and certainly in, in South Korea. So I'm wondering um, sort of how we can, can understand that. The, the, so, you know, if we, we accept that, that this is a failure, that the U.S., you know, alliance with the ROC fails, does that sort of set this pattern of failure or is there, d d does success or failure for, for the U.S. in its subsequent alliance relations depend on, on other factors as well? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly other factors at play, and it, Chiang Kai-shek was the same way. I mean, he did not want the Americans to, to leave in 1948, 1949. He wanted much greater American support. And then, you know, throughout the Cold War, of course, he wanted American backing in coming in and, and retaking the mainland. I think there are some key differences that, that, that happen. Um, I mean, for one thing is this, this alliance really doesn't come down until that geopolitical situation changes, right? Once Japan surrendered, uh, there was no common foreign enemy uh, for, to, to keep the domestic political situation together in China. And, uh, and the communists then hardened their position against the United States. So you had this internal division uh, that you didn't have in a place like Korea during the Cold War. I mean, uh, one element of the Korean War is, uh, you know, this consolidation in control in the South by, by Syngman Rhee. I mean, Korean politics were even probably more fractious than Chinese politics uh, in the immediate post-war period. And then throughout the Cold War and up to the present in South Korea, you have this major external threat that's just right over the border of the 38th parallel. Um, so you don't have this kind of situation like you had in China after 1945 when Japan surrendered. And then there's a couple other key differences, I think, around the issue of sovereignty. Um, so even like issues in, in World War II with uh, resentment over sexual relations, I think the real core issue there is still about sovereignty and the way that Chinese men, Chinese nationals of all stripes come to see uh, women as symbolizing national sovereignty uh, and rape and sex crimes as symbolizing national humiliation. And I talked about this a little bit with the students who are here this morning, is that after World War II, finally in the mid-1960s, the Chinese nationalists got a status of forces agreement that enabled them to exercise jurisdiction in certain cases involving American servicemen, including uh, rape and murder. And right away, after World War II, Japan was able to get a status of forces agreement along the NATO model. So treated equally compared to Western countries. China never got that during World War II, and that was a big source of resentment because they saw the way that British and Australian authorities could arrest and detain American soldiers. And then right away after World War II, when they're still working out this kind of system that comes into play more during the Cold War with this system of alliances, uh, you know, the Chinese also see that they're getting mistreated compared to Japan and that the dynamics have changed. You know, for example, in fall of 1945, as, uh, as U.S. forces are beginning the occupation of Japan and helping the nationalists to take control over Taiwan, you have these two parallel cases where the chief, the Army's chief civil affairs officer, so this is the Army, American Army officer who is responsible for, for liaison with like local civilian elites and local government in Tokyo and in Taipei. They both uh, do a big scam where in Japan, they're able to take hold of diamonds and precious gems uh, that have been in the possession of, Ch of Japanese authorities and then smuggle it out and, and get rich on the black market. And they do the same thing in Taiwan with gold, uh, Japanese army gold bullion. And so both cases get publicized at about the same time. And by this time, these civil affairs officers have fled back to the United States. So in the case of Japan, MacArthur, General Douglas MacArthur, who's the Supreme Commander of Allied Forces, makes this big deal about extraditing this guy back to Japan, uh, giving him a military tribunal, and sentencing him to 10 years in prison. 
Uh, the nationalists see all this happening, and they want the same thing, but the US military won't cooperate. They won't exercise jurisdiction. Eventually, there is a federal court case against this guy in the United States, but he gets off the hook. And you know, the same kind of dynamic precipitated these 1957 riots in Taiwan against the US Embassy and the military advisory headquarters. Uh, so in the case of Japan, an American soldier had killed a Japanese woman. Uh, you know, he claimed it was by accident as she was collecting spent bullet casings. And uh, Japanese demanded to exercise jurisdiction in this case, which they could do under the Status of Forces Agreement. Uh, and the Chinese pointed to this Japanese case and wanted the same thing over this American soldier who had killed this Chinese man who was allegedly looking at his wife in the bathtub. Uh, and the Americans refused to turn him over or hold any kind of joint trial. And uh, yeah, this led then to the next day to protests backed by the Chinese government that by the afternoon became riots, sacked the embassy, MAG headquarters, injured more than 10 Americans. So I think these subtle differences in sovereignty really matter. Um, just a few things. Um, number one, I think... Uh, Characterizing the United States of America as an empire is an objectively false characterization. Um, I think a superpower would be a more apt term. Uh, John Mearsheimer, Robert Cohane, um, any of the international relations, anybody who's an international relations scholar would re wholeheartedly reject that because it's just a misapplication of a, de of a definition. There was, no, uh, there was no occupation. There was no occupation of the United States in Taiwan right now. I don't think Tsai Ing-wen would call, or the president of South Korea right now, or the president of Japan would call the US alliance system an imperial domination. I think they would wholeheartedly reject that claim. And I think, and number two, I don't, I don't know, calling the, the US alliance with the Republic of China as a failed alliance, I think is, uh, I think that's, I think it's objectively false because if you look at it, strategic ambiguity has worked for 40 years and it's probably going to work for another 60. Um, we, have, we have strong security ties with them. President Biden has reiterated United States security commitments to the Taiwanese on multiple occasions. And if anything, with regards to Vietnam, if we failed in Vietnam, not because, not because we were too aggressive, but because we toppled... Uh, DM, we caught, we toppled ZM and leaving in him in power, leaving him in power pro and supporting him, you probably would have a free South Vietnam right now. So I think U.S., with the exception of Vietnam under the Johnson administration, I think U.S. policy in Southeast Asia and Europe has been a tour de force for United States policymakers from George Kennan onwards on what a, su what a responsible superpower and the leader of the free world does. I, mean, I think well, it's, a, it's a different issue what I'm looking at this wartime alliance with the Republic of China than Taiwan today. Because, you know, I'm looking at the story of when the Republic of China governed mainland China. Uh, you know, that, that came to an end in the Civil War in 1949. So, yeah, uh, you know, the Chiang Kai-shek's government fled to Taiwan, initially was not going to get support from the United States. Uh, but the Korean War changed that calculus. As soon as the Korean War broke out, uh, Truman made a decision to send the Seventh Fleet to Taiwan. And prior to that, uh, you know, the U.S. government had basically written it off. Uh, Secretary of State Dean Acheson gave a speech in early 1950 that explicitly excluded Taiwan from the U.S. defense perimeter. And yeah, I mean, I would agree with you to this day. I mean, I think strategic ambiguity with Taiwan, yeah, I mean, obviously it's worked so far. Uh, whether that continues remains to be seen. I mean, I, I sure hope it does continue to work because, I mean, I think China today is more powerful relative to the United States than the Soviet Union ever was during the Cold War. And so, yeah, I mean, I have a hard time seeing how a U.S.-China war doesn't quickly escalate into a kind of nuclear confrontation. Um, you know, regarding Vietnam, I think I'd have to, uh, I think Professor Miller is the, is the expert here on uh, U.S. relations with Zim. 
Um, I was just wondering if in your research, well, when you mentioned like how Chiang Kai-shek wrote the introduction to one of the, I forgot what exactly document you mentioned, it kind of reminded me a lot of discussions that we've had in class about, sorry for people who are not in this class, um, about, you know, being invited into empire or like, you know, we've talked about in the Philippines how the elites played a role of inviting American support into like the nation. Um, so kind of a two-parter question of, was that kind of seen in China where the, well, Chiang Kai-shek, and this is prior to the Civil War or during the Civil War, um, had of invited in American help and aid and, you know, kind of belief in this, like, American system. And I'm wondering, like, what role that played. And then on a different note, um, how much the, you know, the um, people who were being invited in, so like the American military kind of had this belief in a benevolence or in a American exceptionalism. Uh, point of view, and I know a lot of your research probably focuses on the other side of the response on the Chinese side of things, but um, I was wondering on the like the U.S. side of things. Yeah, so I think so. Chiang Kai-shek certainly doesn't look positively on American government models or American culture, um, but what he does want is he wants American-style reform for the Chinese military. He wants a modern military reorganized and equipped along American lines. There's a lot of other people, you know, in different parts of the government, uh, you know, like his brother-in-law, Song Zuwen, who's foreign minister, that was like, that were more pro-American and more sympathetic to other kinds of American models. Uh, but yeah, over the course of the war, like Chiang Kai-shek increasingly understands this kind of relationship as, as imperialist. And uh, although I think there's a lot of, at the high level, there's geopolit the geopolitical drivers of tensions between China and the United States. The, the best example I can think of is at that 1943 Cairo conference, they discussed this reconquest of Burma. And they all agree on this plan that's going to include American and British air and support for amphibious landings, where Chinese ground troops are gonna do most of the fighting. But then after that Cairo conference, Roosevelt goes on to Tehran where he meets with Stalin and Stalin says, uh-uh, you know, we've got to open the second front in Europe. So they prioritize all that amphibious support for Normandy. So the Americans immediately go back on the promises they make to Chiang Kai-shek, but then still insist that he fulfills his promises of the ground offensive, only without any kind of air or naval support. So he was outraged by this, but even like Chiang Kai-shek, didn't understand this in terms of geopolitics. Like he understood a lot of his conflicts with the Americans, both Roosevelt, but particularly Stillwell and other senior military commanders as a result of American arrogance and disregard for Chinese sovereignty. And you see this at all levels. You see that in like these investigation, that investigation of interpreter morale. Like that resentment against the United States is very much a product of specific day-to-day -day interactions between interpreters and American soldiers. And you see it at the military to civilian level more broadly. So initially in 1942, and then again in 1945, uh, the Americans are welcomed as allies, and in 45, they're welcomed as liberators. You know, thousands of people lining the streets, giving a thumbs up sign, saying Ting Hao means very good. Um, but you know, by fall of 1945, uh, Chinese are eager for the Americans to leave Southwest China, and within a little over a year of their arrival in these Chinese coastal cities that were under Japanese occupation, they've also worn out their welcome. And even larger groups of people are taking to the streets demanding that the Americans leave. Uh, you know, as Professor Miller said, you still have a constituency, like particularly within the government and the military that wants the Americans to stay. But within the Chinese military, that wasn't even universal. Uh, you know, during the war, there were a lot of people, uh, senior Chinese commanders, including the ones that got the best American training and equipment uh, that had very contentious relations with U.S. forces. Oh, yes. The attitudes that Americans brought in. So yeah, I think Americans, the, the knowledge they had of China in the 1940s, I think came largely from the missionary movement. So missionaries really saw China as the, the centerpiece of American efforts to 
Christianize the world. And a lot of people in governments and um, in academia, in publishing, had connections to this missionary movement. Uh, none more prominent than Henry Luce, who is the editor of Time magazine. You know, he is like really the, even more than like the Rupert Murdoch of his era, by far the most powerful media magnate in the United States. And he was the child, China-born child of American missionaries. And he built Chiang Kai-shek up in Time magazine, the most popular magazine in the country. Chiang had more covers on Time magazine than anybody else. And he was presented as somebody who was Christianizing and democratizing China. Uh, Another really popular source for information on China is another child of missionaries, the novelist Pearl Buck, uh, who wrote about China in her best-selling novel, The Good Earth. Eventually, she got the Nobel Prize in Literature. The Good Earth was made into this uh, movie uh, that was very popular before the war as well. And beyond that, there is this sort of more uh, openly kind of racist image of the Chinese that you see in things like the Fu Manchu movies that posit Chinese as devious and untrustworthy. So I think this really influences a lot of Americans in China. So I think when things go their way and the relationship is one where they feel Chinese are following American methods, are grateful for American aid, they can be happy. Like when Americans are the ones that judge the efficiency of Chinese interpreters and the highest praise they can give them is like, he's a friend of the United States. He understands our methods. Those are the ones they think that are best. But then in situations where they don't feel Chinese are following American models, then, you know, it's, it's outrage. And that's when the racist kind of resentment comes out. Zach, there's uh, one question online here for you. It says, uh, thank you for your powerful talk. I just finished reading your book and thoroughly enjoyed your writing and scholarship. You mentioned in the preface that you worked six years for the U.S. State Department before entering graduate school, and I speculate that you probably witnessed some ground activities of U.S. Foreign Service men abroad. Did the previous experience in any way impact your conclusions about the negative results of American assistance in China? Oh, well, I, d- I did not work in the Foreign Service. Um, I, I never worked in the government. What I did is I did work for six years before I went to graduate school, and most of that was in China. So I worked, in, I worked initially in, in the Middle East right after graduation, and then I got a job uh, at a Chinese university and then in like a, in a Sino-American British joint venture that was like a postgraduate diploma program for students going on to do master's degrees in the UK and uh, in the United States. So, this, so I didn't really have any training in Chinese language or Chinese history during college. I, did, I had nothing to do with China at all. Um, but that time living in China, and I lived in the Southwest, uh, where U.S. forces were deployed during the war, and I was able to build up enough Chinese language skills to be able to apply for a graduate program you know, focused on U.S.-China relations. So yeah, I mean, I think that experience of being in China, it definitely gave me connections that were helpful in doing research because they needed support from local universities, and I had that before I even started graduate school. And I think what I was most interested in, I remember like writing my... My, uh, my personal statements for graduate school. And I was interested in what I saw in this kind of paradoxical Chinese perception of the United States. Like I, I met so many people who were like so overtly anti-American, um, yet they also like their goal was to immigrate to the United States or they were like wearing a Nike t-shirt or talking to me about basketball. You know, I can remember even like one time talking to somebody who, you know, as a screensaver was Osama bin Laden. And he was saying that bin Laden was his hero. But then he's like asking me about advice to like for his kids TOEFL. And so this, this sort of paradoxical resentment towards, but then fascination with the United States. And so for this project, I mean, I think, Yeah, it was a little bit different from what I wrote my personal statement about, but what I really liked about this project was pretty early on in graduate school, I tried a more straight up traditional kind of diplomatic history approach to US-China relations, where I was just looking at like government perceptions of China and the Kennedy administration. And I was like, this is kind of a cool project, but like I wanna do something that's like, that's got a bigger source base. And so I think it was, 
Um, I did a graduate paper about the Marines in China after World War II, because I was unaware that Marines had ever landed there. So I thought, this is pretty interesting. Uh, maybe I can do a dissertation on this. And then I read Van de Ven's work. I think at the time I just read an article, then later read his book, and that really set me on this path. And I said, well, to understand this uh, Marine Corps presence, I've got to look at this longer trajectory of the US military in China. And yeah, I mean, I was able, I think, to identify more at this project, you know, because I, you know, in my early 20s, mid 20s, I was in Southwest China as well. And so a lot of these places, Kunming, Chongqing, Chengdu were kind of familiar to me. And I felt like maybe it gave me a little bit more of a stake in the project. And then I just got lucky to research it at a time when things were a little more open. So you mentioned the uh, disdain and the fascination for the United States within China. Mm -hmm. um, I find that a bit surprising given that before we opened trade with them in 1972, they were poor. Uh, Mao's cultural revolution had failed. And because the United States opened up um, trade with China, one over a billion people were lifted out of poverty and their lives were saved. Um, what extent do you think, to what extent do you think that the Chinese disdain for American multiculturalism and capitalism in our worldview has to do with Chinese propaganda, and what extent do you think it's cultural and that the Confucian way of their, their belief in Confucianism has, to, uh, has led them to disdain our individualism? Yeah, I don't know if it's, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's a belief in Confucianism. I mean, certainly in China, um, you know, the, the reform and opening, like under, under Deng Xiaoping that started in the late 70s, I mean, above all, that was a recognition of the failures of Maoism and an understanding that above all, uh, for China to develop economically, they needed good relations with the West, especially in the United States and also Japan. So yeah, I mean, I think to this day still, it is this kind of paradoxical understanding. If you look at like public opinion surveys in China, you know, which have their problems, you know, doing public opinion in a, an authoritarian country is difficult. And so there's issues, with the accuracy of that kind of information. But, you know, things come up pretty negative for the United States. But among like what I would see as like the upper middle class, upper class, the kind of urban elite, uh, there's still a very heavy influence of American culture. Uh, I mean, people, yeah, they really follow uh, American celebrity gossip, American sports, and generally a lot want their kids to be educated in the United States. Uh, and with like COVID and the, fight, and the deterioration of U.S.-China relations, I think like among that elite, there's even more of a demand to come to the United States. I think a lot of parents are kind of, they want their kids to have an exit strategy. I mean, I wouldn't say, see it as disdain for American capitalism at all. I mean, I think like you know, China is a, is a hyper-capitalist place. And the most common question I've ever been asked, like being in China, I've probably spent 10 years in China altogether, like during, uh, before grad school, and working at this job at Duke Kunshan. I mean, the most common question I get asked is, what's my salary? And people are obsessed with quantitative indicators of financial success, the square footage of a house, um, you know, the kind of car you have. I remember when I was doing my dissertation research, I, I lived near this park where parents met up to kind of arrange, not, not arrange marriages, but uh, you know, close to that, where they would try to meet up and, and play matchmaker for their kids. And it was all about money. Like you see singles ads in the United States, it's more about you know, what I'm interested in, hobbies. There it was more like salary, height, type of car. So, I mean, I think it is, it's, a, it's a very capitalist place. I mean, the kind of economy there is much more similar to the authoritarian state capitalism of Chiang Kai-shek than to like, you know, the collective farms uh, and cultural revolution of Mao. Sure. I think we've reached the end of our time here. So I'd just like to say thank you to Professor Fredman and echo both Professors Miller for uh, congratulations on all the work you've done. And uh, it's great to see that some of it was done here. And thank you for coming back and presenting it and uh, giving us the opportunity to ask questions about it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for, for coming out here for your late afternoon and, and listening to my talk. If you've got further questions, you know, you can just, just Google me at Duke Kunshan. I'm happy to answer questions over email. <laughs>